Welcome to a special edition of GMTV's Sunday programme. I'm Chris Smith, here at Coventry Cathedral, perhaps the most potent symbol there is of the power of destruction and of regeneration. And I'll be looking at some of the finest writing of the 20th century, at W.H. Auden, at T.S. Eliot, and at Philip Larkin. Juliet Stevenson will be reading some of her favourite poems, and I'll be talking with Andrew Motion, the Poet Laureate, about what it is this poetry is all about, and how it can move us to an understanding of the suffering world in which we now live. The cathedral in Coventry was built in the 14th century, but destroyed by fire bombs in 1940. And some of the charred rafters were fashioned into this cross as a reminder of what happened and as a symbol of reconciliation. A poet who struggled through his life to understand some of these issues was W.H. Auden. Richard Holloway, the former Bishop of Edinburgh, will explore that uh, spiritual journey in a moment or two. But first, a poem that Auden wrote uh, shortly before the Second World War. It's called the Musée des Beaux-Arts. It's about a painting in a museum in Brussels. But it seeks to understand some of that strangeness of human suffering. About suffering, they were never wrong, the old masters. How well they understood its human position. How it takes place while someone else is eating, or opening a window, or just walking dully along. How, when the aged are reverently, passionately waiting for the miraculous birth, there always must be children who did not specially want it to happen, skating on a pond at the edge of the wood. They never forgot that even the dreadful martyrdom must run its course anyhow, in a corner, some untidy spot where the dogs go on with their doggy life and the torturer's horse scratches its innocent behind on a tree. In Bruegel's Icarus, for instance, how everything turns away quite leisurely from the disaster. The ploughman may have heard the splash, the forsaken cry, but for him it was not an important failure. The sun shone as it had to on the white legs disappearing into the green water and the expensive, delicate ship that must have seen something amazing. A boy falling out of the sky had somewhere to get to and sailed calmly on. You could argue that Musée de Beaux-Arts is W.H. Auden's most significant poem because it acts as a kind of prologue to one of his most significant preoccupations, which was the problem of suffering. He wrote it in 1938 as the world was beginning to go mad and suffering, pain, human anguish were things that obsessed him, partly because he himself was a deeply conflicted individual. And like a lot of people of his generation, he flirted with uh, the utopian answer of communism. But significantly, he came back to the Christianity of his childhood that didn't so much solve the problem of suffering as provide him with a vocabulary that enabled him to express the mystery of it. Auden tells us that his long journey back to Christian faith began in a garden one night with a group of friends when he had an extraordinary and irresistible experience of the meaning of Christian love, agape, true love, disinterested love of the neighbor. One fine summer night in June 1933, I was sitting on a lawn after dinner with three colleagues, two women and one man. None of us had any sexual interest in any of the others, nor had we drunk any alcohol. We were talking casually about everyday matters when quite suddenly and unexpectedly something happened. I felt myself invaded by a power which, though I consented to it, was irresistible and certainly not mine. 
For the first time in my life, I knew exactly what it means to love one's neighbor as oneself. Among the various factors which several years later brought me back to the Christian faith, the memory of this experience was one of the most crucial, though at the time it occurred, I thought I had done with Christianity for good. Out on the lawn, I lie in bed, vaguer, conspicuous overhead in the windless nights of June. As congregated leaves complete their day's activity, my feet point to the rising moon. Lucky this point in time and space is chosen as my working place, with the sexy airs of summer, the bathing hours and the bare arms, the leisure drives through a land of farms are good to a newcomer. Equal with colleagues in a ring, I sit on each calm evening, enchanted as the flowers the opening light draws out of hiding, with all its gradual, dove-like pleading, its logic and its powers. Now north and south and east and west, those I love lie down to rest. The moon looks on them all, the healers and the brilliant talkers, the eccentrics and the silent walkers, the dumpy and the tall. Those are lovely, tender words. And this is perhaps the most attractive thing about Auden, this deep sympathy for the human condition and the way we damage and hurt one another. It was one reason also, I think, why he revered one who was almost a prophet to him, Sigmund Freud, because he loved the way Freud lifted the lid off the dark churnings of the human heart and made us look at the depth of our own nature and not deny any of it. Because if we deny it, it turns us into oppressive monsters. And one of his most powerful poems is the one he wrote celebrating this latter-day Old Testament prophet in memory of Sigmund Freud. He was taken away from his life interest to go back to the earth in London, an important Jew who died in exile. Only hate was happy, hoping to augment his practice now and his dingy clientele who think they can be cured by killing and covering the garden with ashes. They are still alive, but in a world he changed simply by looking back with no false regrets. All he did was to remember like the old and be honest like children. He wasn't clever at all. He merely told the unhappy present to recite the past like a poetry lesson, till sooner or later it faltered at the line where long ago the accusations had begun, and suddenly knew by whom it had been judged, how rich life had been and how silly, and was life forgiven and more humble, able to approach the future as a friend without a wardrobe of excuses, without a set mask of rectitude or an embarrassing, over-familiar gesture. No wonder the ancient cultures of conceit, in his technique of unsettlement, foresaw the fall of princes, the collapse of their lucrative patterns of frustration. Of course, they called on God, but he went his way down among the lost people like Dante, down to the stinking foss where the injured lead the ugly life of the rejected, and showed us what evil is. Not, as we thought, deeds that must be punished, but our lack of faith, our dishonest mood of denial, the concupiscence of the oppressor. The concupiscence of the oppressor, my God, that's a powerful, powerful phrase concupiscence, sexual longing. In Christian theology, it has a deep resonant history because, of course, the church has been very suspicious of sexuality. And, of course, something that's denied takes its revenge. In the concupiscence of oppression, we become punishers of longings that we ourselves do not admit. Auden was obsessed by the problem of suffering and pain, the evil that we do to one another. I wonder what he would have made of September the 11th in his own city, because he loved that city. He lived in it for um, 40 years. In one of his most remarkable poems, Friday's Child, 
He offers us the classic Christian answers to the problem of pain. Human freedom. When God gave us freedom, God willed the possibility of the evil that we do to one another. But the second and more troubling part of the Christian answer, if it is an answer to the problem of evil, is that God is not detached from it, but endures it with us. Ours is a crucified God. I myself find these answers unpersuasive on the philosophical level, but they're powerfully symbolic and they do give you much to meditate on. And Friday's Child is a poem to spend time pondering. He told us we were free to choose. But children as we were, we thought paternal love will only use force in the last resort on those too bumptious to repent. Accustomed to religious dread, it never crossed our minds he meant exactly what he said. Perhaps he frowns, perhaps he grieves, but it seems idle to discuss if anger or compassion leaves the bigger bangs to us. What reverence is rightly paid to a divinity so odd he lets the Adam whom he made perform the acts of God? Since the analogies are rot our senses based belief upon, we have no means of learning what is really going on and must put up with having learned all proofs or disproofs that we tender of his existence are returned unopened to the sender. Now did he really break the seal and rise again? We dare not say. But conscious unbelievers feel quite sure of judgment day. Meanwhile, a silence on the cross, as dead as we shall ever be, speaks of some total gain or loss. And you and I are free to guess from the insulted face just what appearances he saves by suffering in a public place, a death reserved for slaves. What a powerful poem Friday's Child is. Auden wrote it in tribute to Dietrich Bonhoeffer, one of the real heroes of the 20th century, a, a priest who deliberately went back into Germany at the height of the Second World War and was martyred in a concentration camp. Shortly, I'll be looking at another poet who wrote about another rather more ancient martyr, but related that to suffering and modern suffering too. But in the meantime, let's take a short break.